To build this coat rack, you'll need very minimal materials. A few 2x2s and some 1x2s. I had some leftover ash wood that I milled up, but any hardwood can be used. Okay, let's take a look at the design. As you can see, it's a double tree with two posts. Everything is assembled using lap joints or dados if you prefer. I'll start by the top part and cut three dados on an angle in each post that will house the arms of the trees. There are several ways that you can go about cutting these joints, but I've always wanted to try using my miter saw. My miter saw has a depth stop, which is simply this little lever here. By flipping it out, it creates a stop. And you can adjust the screw until you have the exact depth that you want. I've marked this leftover 2x2 so I can do a test and dial in the depth. One thing that you'll notice is that the blade can't reach the line at the very back when using the stop. So I added a sacrificial board at the back that I'll clamp down. I made a few test cuts, nudging the board slightly between each cut. You can see that the blade bottoms out all the way through, which is perfect. That being said, I'm getting uneven cuts with varying depths. Upon closer inspection, I noticed that my miter saw's stop has some spring to it, and the depth can vary a little depending on how much pressure you apply. So with that noted, I tried again, applying consistent pressure, and the results were much better. With the test complete, it's time to get started on the posts. Measuring from the top, I made my first mark and carried it across both posts using a combination square. I could then rotate each post, make another mark, and repeat for the third and final mark. Next, I set my miter saw to 30 degrees and locked it in. I put the sacrificial fence back in place and locked it down as well then cut a kerf line that will serve as a reference. With that done, I can drop in my post and line up my first marking with the very edge of the kerf line. I'll repeat the same for each of the markings, making a single cut. By the way, you may notice that I swapped out my blade here. I put in a flat bottom blade to help eliminate some of the ridges left at the bottom of the cut. Now that I have a reference cut, I'll use one of the 1x2 arms to mark the other side of the joint. I prefer this to measuring, especially when there are angles involved. I'll line it up right on the edge of the cut without going over, then mark the opposite side. Again, here's a closer look. I'll creep up to the edge, I don't want to see any black, but just be right up against the edge of the cut. I can now go back to the miter saw and line up my second cut. I'll line up my marking with the left edge of the kerf here, so that the teeth of the blade just kiss the line without cutting through it. I can then slowly nudge the board over and progressively hog out the remaining material. And now I can do a test fit just to make sure it fits. Perfect. As you can see, the blade I switched to does a better job here with fewer ridges showing, but it's still not dead flat. To fix this, I glued some sandpaper to a small block that I'll use to clean up the joint. Not perfect, but it's good enough. All right, next I'm going to work on the arms of the tree. There are six identical arms cut on an angle. I haven't touched my miter saw setup as you can see, so I can just cancel the depth stop and go ahead and cut one side of each of the one by twos. This way I know the angle will match perfectly with the angle on my post. I'll then set up a stop and trim all the pieces to length. One more check to be safe and looking perfect so far. Okay, there's one more thing I want to do here, and that's chamfer the top edges so they won't catch or damage any of the stuff that hangs on the rack. To make this easier and help prevent tear out from my router, I'll clamp them together and add a sacrificial board on the end. I'll then run my router along the edge using a chamfer bit and repeat this on all four sides. I decided to do the same thing to the top of the post for a cleaner and consistent look. With the top part done, it's time to move on to the base, which is made up of four interlocking pieces, which will make this coat rack really stable. We'll take this step by step. I'll start by tapering each of the pieces as shown here. So here are my four blanks. I'll grab one and mark up from the bottom, and also mark inwards from the edge. Then connect those lines using a ruler. I'll then transfer those markings onto the side of the piece using a combination square. 
By the way, if you're like me and get really dry, cracked hands working in the shop, I highly recommend getting this hand cream. I pick some up every time I go to Princess Auto and always keep some on hand in the shop. It really helps. To cut the taper, I'll use my homemade tapering jig. I made a video about this a few years ago that I'll link up here if you want to check that out. You'll want to line up the markings on the very edge of the jig, then push the fence up against it and lock it down. Okay, let's take it over to the table saw. The jig slides on a runner in the miter slot. Now mine doesn't have a handle, so I like to use the push stick to slowly guide it through the blade. After cutting one side, I can just flip it around and cut the other side. The great thing about this jig is that you only need to mark one of the pieces. After that, just drop in the next board without touching any of the settings and you'll get the exact same taper. Easy peasy. Okay, so with the tapers cut, we'll move on to cutting the notches for the posts. Just as before, I'll measure and mark one side with a combination square, then use one of the work pieces to mark the other side of the joint. This time I'll use my table saw to cut the lap joints. I'll first set my blade height and lock it in. Now these notches go on the inside of each piece and need to be perfectly aligned. The easiest way to achieve this is to tape the pieces together and cut them both at once. It helps to use a miter gauge with a sacrificial fence attached for extra support. Here you see me lining up the first cut. I'm looking to get the tip of the tooth of the blade to touch the inside of the line. Once I have that lined up, I'll make my first cut. I'll then turn off the saw and again line up the tip of the tooth on the inside of the other line and make the cut. Once I have both references cut, I can just hog away the waist in the middle. And voila. Of course, before removing the tape, I'll also do a test fit to make sure. Yep, I'm pretty happy with that. Next, it's time to cut the half laps to add in the other cross braces that'll make up the base. Cutting these is very similar to what I just did previously, but this time the depth of the lap joint has to be exactly half the thickness of the board, so that when both pieces come together, they're perfectly flush. I have a video from a few years back showing a foolproof method of doing this, and I'll link that above. The trick to setting the blade height is this. First, roughly mark half the thickness of the board on a leftover piece of the same stock you're going to use. Then raise the blade, but stay just under the line. Make a cut on the end, then flip it over and make a second cut. You'll be left with a little bit of material in the middle, and that's what you want. Now you can nudge the blade up ever so slightly and cut again in the same spot. It shouldn't go all the way through on the first cut, but will on the second cut. That's perfect. Okay, so I'll lock in that blade height and make a test cut in some leftover pieces. And the test fits perfectly, so I'll keep these settings locked in and make the cuts. Just as before, you want to cut both sides first, then remove the material in the middle. Okay, last but not least, we're going to make the half laps in the top pieces so they can interlock with the bottom pieces. Now we'll just speed through the process here because I think by now you kind of get the idea. All right, now is the moment of truth to see if it all fits together. I did not rehearse this, so I really hope that it does. Otherwise, this might be a little embarrassing. It's a little snug, but with the help of a mallet, it finally all comes together. At this point, I opted to make a slight modification to the design and decided to add a cross brace between both posts for stability. This far into the project, I can say without a doubt that I prefer cutting these joints on the table saw rather than the miter saw and luckily for me, I had enough room to do this, just barely. It's finally time for assembly. I decided to do the glue up in stages to make it easier, starting with gluing the posts to the base. As you can see, I used some painter's tape to help manage squeeze out. I figure I'll end up with quite a mess with all these joints being in close proximity to each other, so 
Having the tape will make it easier to keep glue off my workpiece. Swear I won't forget this, why do I regret this? In my mind reckless, thoughts are feeling endless Sitting up I'm breathless, anxiety's infectious I feel so defenseless, betrayed and embarrassed I hate being open, I hate being broken I feel like an ocean filled up with emotion Anger ain't a potion, rub it on like lotion I can feel it so I'm going to give this coat rack a two-tone finish. While I sand and prep for finish, I want to let you know that DAP Canada is giving away a Home Depot gift card to one lucky viewer. All you have to do is give their YouTube channel a follow and comment down below. Check out the full giveaway rules in the description down below. After sanding everything down, I'll apply two coats of Osmo to the top half. I love how easy this is to apply. Just rub it on, then wipe it off. That's it. As for the bottom half, I want to paint it black, but more than that. I want it to look almost like metal without any visible joints or even visible wood grain. That's why I'll use DAP's premium wood filler. Its thin light texture is amazing as a grain filler. I'll just smooth it over the entire base and fill in every single crack. You know the saying, it gets worse before it gets better? That's definitely what's going through my mind at this point. But after it dries, I can sand it all down using 220 grit until everything is smooth and flat. I'll then remove all the dust. I set up a little paint booth here and I'll start by applying a coat of primer to seal the wood filler. They didn't have any black so I got a grey primer instead. Once that's dry, I'll give it a light sanding with 220 grit and finish off with two or three coats of flat black spray paint. To be strong every breath of, Cause I can't move on till I let go